Hello everyone, welcome back. We have been talking about encryption. Make sure you can hear me. Oh yeah, that microphone levels is just a bouncing. So encryption, what we're talking about, the main ways that encryption kind of manifests itself on the internet and what is encryption anyway? It's, it's where we take something, some type of message, some type of data, and we scramble it to the point that if someone got a hold of it, it wouldn't matter. So the main two ways that encryption kind of manifests itself on the internet is number one, packets. We talked quite a bit about packets and that is how it, that's how data is sent over the internet. We take a file, we break it down into as many packets as we need. Each packet consists of a header, which contains very important information like where does the packet need to go? That is a destination IP address. Where is it coming from? That is a source IP address and some type of ID number, a sequence number, so that all that information can be put back together. That is the header header. That is not encrypted. It can't be. It can't be because as it goes from router to router to router, jumping around the internet, uh, those routers need to know where to send it to. So we can encrypt that information. What is encrypted is the contents of the packet, what we call the payload. And the whole idea is, even with uh, the, the packets going through routers, if someone was to do what we call packet sniffing, that is they get a hold of the packet and they look inside and they see what it is, it wouldn't matter because it's encrypted. The vast majority of data being sent around the internet these days is encrypted. So if someone gets a hold of the packet, it doesn't matter. They can't read it. That's the whole idea. Another way that this kind of manifests itself, we talked about this, but is um, in passwords. Passwords should be encrypted before they are stored in the database. So in the event that the database gets compromised, someone can't obtain your password because it's a jumbled mess. And the real reason that exists is that they can't then cross-reference your password with other websites. The fear is not that someone hacks into a website, some type of service, and they get hold of your password and then, aha, they can go into that service as you. Well, they're already in the service. They've already hacked the database. So that's really not that big of a deal. The problem is most people use the similar password, if not the same password, for multiple services. So if someone hacks your password with one service, they can then start cross-referencing it with other things. And so what we end up doing is encrypting passwords before storing them into um, a database. So there's the main two ways that encryption uh, happens. And uh, we actually talked about three different encryption methods last time that we met. One was the Caesar cipher. We actually coded this one back in uh, the fall. And that's where we basically just shift the alphabet. Like here is a Caesar cipher shift of three. We have our plain alphabet. And so something written in plain text, we would then run it through our Caesar cipher, where in this case, a shift of three is applied. And so A gets encoded as X and B gets encoded as Y. The main problem with Caesar cipher is that it's easy to crack. There's really only like 26 different combinations. I guess technically 25, because once you do 26, you're back to normal. Anyway, so uh, Caesar cipher is not great. We then talked about substitution cipher, random substitution cipher. That's where we effectively assign each letter to something else randomly. This is better. It still is not great because with frequency analysis, we can basically go through and figure out what the message actually says. You can decrypt it pretty reasonably using frequency analysis. For instance, E, T, A, and O appear most often in the English alphabet. So if you encounter whatever letter is in the encrypted text, the cipher text, as it's also known, whatever letter occurs most frequently, it is probably an E. The second most frequent letter is probably a T. And so this is better than Caesar cipher, but still not great. Um, where it starts getting pretty good is a visionaire cipher. Okay. This is where the encryption is based off a key. And what's so great about this, why don't we go through our tool and I'm going to pop up a code.org
Let's go find this thing on code.org so we can just quickly recap an example of it. Like the true definition of this is going to talk about how it's like multiple Caesar cipher shifts. And that's true. Here, the way it's laid out, it looks like a 2D array, which is also kind of true. There's multiple ways basically to, to end up doing this. The most important part is we have some type of message that we want to encode right, our plain text. We have some type of key. And the way that it gets encrypted is basically based off both. So we're going to take I, I want to encrypt it, and we're going to use the first letter of our secret key. And we're going to see where, oh, I don't want to play, I just want to step through it. Bag it up, sunshine. We'll restart that. So I'll just do one step. I want to encode I. Here we see our I. I'm going to use my key first letter of my key is M, where those intersect is that is what it gets encoded as. And what is great about this, as we kind of step through and we can see how these things get encoded, what's so great about this is that I could hand you encoded text. All right, let's encode the whole thing. I could hand you this message, this cipher text down here. It has been encoded. I can tell you I use the Visionaire cipher in order to do that you still couldn't decode it, not in a reasonable amount of time. What we talk about as reasonable is that if we were to put it through a computer algorithm, you know, some type of computer program that we wrote that's trying to crack code, it would just take too long or at least too many attempts. One way that websites or services frequently kind of try to control this situation is that they limit the number of attempts that you can have. So I can hand you the ciphertext. I can tell you it's visionary cipher. I use Visionaire Cipher to encode it, and it would still be really difficult. It would be computationally hard in order to decrypt it. You ultimately need the key. And so what it is most important here is this secret key, and that's what it becomes about. And that is going to lead us into today's discussion, which is about um, asymmetric versus symmetric encryption. Let's back this up. Uh, we got a code.org video starting out. Hi, my name is Mia Gil Eppner. I'm majoring in computer science at UC Berkeley, and I work for the Department of Defense, where I try to keep information safe. The internet is an open and public system. We all send and receive information over shared wires and connections. But even though it's an open system, we still exchange a lot of private data. Things like credit card numbers, bank information, passwords, and emails. So how is all this private stuff kept secret? Data of any kind can be kept secret through a process known as encryption, the scrambling or changing of the message to hide the original text. Now decryption is the process of unscrambling that message to make it readable. This is a simple idea and people have been doing it for centuries. One of the first well-known methods of encryption was Caesar's cipher, named after Julius Caesar, a Roman general who encrypted his military commands to make sure that if a message was intercepted by enemies, they wouldn't be able to read it. Caesar's cipher is an algorithm that substitutes each letter in the original message with a letter a certain number of steps down the alphabet. If the number is something only the sender and receiver know, then it's called the key. It allows the reader to unlock the secret message. For example, if your original message is hello, then using the Caesar cipher algorithm with a key of five, the encrypted message would be this. To decrypt the message, the recipient would simply use the key to reverse the process. But there's a big problem with Caesar cipher. Anybody can easily break or crack the encrypted message by trying every possible key. In the English alphabet, there are only 26 letters, which means you'd only need to try at most 26 keys to decrypt the message. Now, trying 26 possible keys isn't very hard. It would take at most an hour to do. So let's make it harder. Instead of shifting every letter by the same amount, let's shift each letter by a different amount. In this example, a 10-digit key shows how many positions each successive letter will be changed to encrypt a longer message. Guessing this key would be really hard. Using 10-digit encryption, 
there could be 10 billion possible key solutions. Obviously, that's more than any human could ever solve. It would take many centuries. But an average computer today would take just a few seconds to try all 10 billion possibilities. So in a modern world, where the bad guys are armed with computers instead of pencils, how can you encrypt messages so securely that they're too hard to crack? Now, too hard means that there are too many possibilities to compute in a reasonable amount of time. Today's secure communications are encrypted using 256-bit keys. That means a bad guy's computer that intercepts your message would need to try this many possible options until they discover the key and crack the message. Even if you had 100,000 supercomputers and each of them was able to try a million billion keys every second, it would take trillions of trillions of trillions of years to try every option just to crack a single message protected with 256-bit encryption. Of course, computer chips get twice as fast and half the size every year or so. If that pace of exponential progress continues, today's impossible problems will be solvable just a few hundred years in the future, and 256 bits won't be enough to be safe. In fact, we've already had to increase the standard key length to keep up with the speed of computers. The good news is, using a longer key doesn't make encrypting messages much harder, but it exponentially increases the number of guesses that it would take to crack a cipher. When the sender and the receiver share the same key to scramble and unscramble a message, it's called symmetric encryption. With symmetric encryption, like Caesar's cipher, the secret key has to be agreed on ahead of time by two people in private. So that's great for people, but the internet is open and public, so it's impossible for two computers to meet in private to agree on a secret key. Instead, computers use asymmetric keys, a public key that can be exchanged with anybody and a private key that is not shared. The public key is used to encrypt data, and anybody can use it to create a secret message. But the secret can only be decrypted by a computer with access to the private key. How this works is with some math that we won't get into right now. Think of it this way. Imagine that you have a personal mailbox where anybody can deposit mail, but they need a key to do it. Now you could make many copies of the deposit key and send one to your friend or even just make it publicly available. Your friend or even a stranger can use the public key to access your deposit slot and drop a message in. But only you can open the mailbox with your private key to access all of the secret messages you've received. And you can send a secure message back to your friend by using the public deposit key to their mailbox. This way, people can exchange secure messages without ever needing to agree on a private key. Public key cryptography is the foundation of all secure messaging on the open internet, including the security protocols known as SSL and TLS, which protect us when we're browsing the web. Your computer uses this today anytime you see the little lock or the letters HTTPS in your browser's address bar. This means your computer is using public key encryption to exchange data securely with the website you're on. As more and more people get on the internet, more and more private data will be transmitted and the need to secure that data will be even more important. And as computers become faster and faster, we'll have to develop new ways to make encryption too hard for computers to break. This is what I do with my work, and it's always changing. Okay, so there's two types of encryption. We got symmetric and we got asymmetric. So we learned three encryption algorithms, Caesar cipher, random substitution, and the visionary cipher. All three of those are symmetric. With symmetric encryption, it requires the use of a secret key known, as, known to both the sender and receiver. So the key used to encrypt is the same used to decrypt. In the case of Caesar's cipher, right, we're talking about a shift of three. Well, you apply a negative shift in order to undo that action. In the case of uh, the visionaire cipher, you can basically, once you have that key, you can uh, run it back and actually figure out, you know, what uh, what the encrypted text was. Ooh, let's see if I still have my window pulled up. 
right? So take this message that we were encrypting. Let's start it over. What I would end up giving you, right, is this cipher text. However, if you knew the key, you could effectively run it back and decrypt it, right? You would know N and you would know C from the key. And using those, you could figure out that L is the actual uh, plain text that was there. So again, the point is the key used to encrypt is the same used to decrypt. This is symmetrical. Now, again, the three algorithms that we looked at, Caesar cipher, random substitution, visionaire cipher, those are all symmetric. The main difficulty, these are really cute, but the reason that we don't use them is that how do you transmit that secret key? Okay, we're trying to send stuff over the internet, and I'm telling you that packets get encrypted. That way, if someone gets a hold of them and they look at it, it's perfectly fine. And you and I, in real life, we can rendezvous and be like, we're going to use Caesar Cipher with a shift of five. And like, okay, and then all messages we send is no problem. But in the internet, like, I need to talk to Amazon. Amazon doesn't know who I am. How in the world are we going to securely exchange keys? And the answer is you can't. It's a problem because I can't encrypt the key because how in the world would you decrypt it? See what I mean? So that is the problem with symmetric algorithms. So all of these are cute. These three, they're awesome. If you're doing a, um, a coding competition through Science Olympiad where you're trying to encode or decode messages, those are really cute and fun. But in the real world, the internet, what we end up using is asymmetric encryption algorithms. The pretty much the only one that gets used, the one that we've talked about, is just public key, private key encryption. Okay, so the idea behind public key, private key is that there is a key pair. One person, let's say me, has a public key. That same person, me, has a private key. And any messages sent to me can be sent to me encoded using the public key. I could decode it using my private key. So I'm the only one that can decrypt messages encoded with my public key. This approach avoids the difficulty of a secret key transmission, but introduces a new problem. The relationship between the decryption key and the encryption key must be successfully, sorry, sufficiently complex so that it's not possible to derive the decryption key from knowledge of the public encryption keys. So the the only problem here with this idea is that there ha this key pair has to be closely linked enough that anything encoded with a public key can be decoded with a private key, but that relationship can't be so close that given the public key, right, you could figure out what the private key is. Um, we're gonna jump to this video because it does a much better job of explaining public key, private key, and we'll come back to this idea. This is, again, how all of the secure data is sent around the internet. The thing I wanted to talk about today, um, one of the things, is uh, the coolness that is public-private key cryptography. The basic idea of how it works, I think, is, uh, is just cool. It's such a clever idea that I wanted to explain it. So everyone's familiar with the basic idea of crypto where you, um, you have a secret key, you use that to encode some information which converts it from a readable form into uh, garbage, effectively. Um, it's ra it looks like random noise. You then transfer that to somebody else and they are then able to decrypt it and get the message out and anyone who's listening in on your communication um, isn't able to find out anything about the information that you're communicating. The way that you intuitively think about it, especially if you're doing uh, these simple codes, something like a Caesar cipher that you might do um, uh, when you're a kid. Um, there's, one, there's one secret that you both have, right? This is, this is a symmetric system. So you've got your message, you're saying hello, and then you do some process to it to convert it using a key that's some secret piece of information, which then converts this into nonsense, and then you send this to the other person and they decrypt it with a process that's kind of this same process in reverse using the same key and then they get hello 
back out the other end. And that's nice and simple and it works. Um, and it was once uh, sort of the only way that people did things. But it has a problem, which is you both need to know what this key is. So if it's you and me and we want to communicate with one another privately, we have to agree on a key that nobody else is going to be able to guess. And we have to share it with one another. Um, so we might meet in the park in secret and exchange envelopes or whatever. This is the kind of thing spies used to do, right? Um, and the problem with that is, firstly, it's very inconvenient. And secondly, sometimes you can't do it. Like, we might be physically separated. Um, we, or we want to do something over the internet. Maybe we've never met. Um, and the problem is, how do I send this key to you without just sending the key in the clear, as it were, unencrypted? In order for us to share the key safely, we need a secure encrypted connection, but we can't establish a secure encrypted connection without a key. There's a way of solving this problem, which is asymmetric encryption, um, where what you do is you generate two keys, key A and key B. Let's just call them. I'm going to draw a line here. Asymmetric system, you have two keys. And then basically it's the same as before. You've got your message that says hello. You encrypt it with key A to say whatever it was that I decided it was before, and then back out, you get hello again, and the decryption in this case uses key B. You can't guess one key from the other, but they're linked in such a way that anything you encrypt with key A can only be decrypted with key B, and anything you encrypt with key B can only be decrypted with key A. So there's two. And what you do is uh, you generate a pair of these keys, which is called a key pair, and you just pick one of them and say, this is my public key, right? And your public key is public. You publish it everywhere. You put it, uh, you know, you put it on the end of all your emails, your forum posts. You uh, upload it to a key server, which is a specialized server system that's designed for um, storing, securely storing people's, people's public keys. Basically, the idea is uh, it's everywhere out there in the world with your name on it. The private key is the other key of this pair. That one you keep absolutely secret. You can do some cool things with this once you have this system set up. I have a key pair, you have a key pair, we both have one another's public keys. So now, if you want to send me a message, I don't have to share anything with you. You just know my public key, encrypt something with my public key, send it to me, you know I can decrypt it because you know I have my private key. And then there's another thing you can do with this, which is... Okay, we need to, we need to first understand that level of this. Right, there's a key pair. Let's see if I can pull over this image. I don't know if this helps us or not. So with this image, Bob is trying to send something to Alice. In order for Bob to send to Alice, Bob would get a hold of Alice's public key. It is, just as the name suggests, completely public. You share it everywhere. You don't care. Right? If Bob wants to send a message to Alice, Bob will use Alice's public key to encrypt it. That'll jumble it up. We see it's a jumbled mess here. Alice's private key is the only thing that can decrypt this message. So whenever Alice receives it, she uses the private key to decrypt it. Now, when you see Bob and Alice, one of the things I kind of want you to kind of think about in the back of your head is uh, maybe yourself and Amazon. Right? If, you, if Amazon wants to send you a message, they would use your public key in order to do that. Now, this gets handled... Uh, through your browser, basically. So you, you're not coming up with a key pair yourself. But let's say that Amazon wants to send a message to you. Amazon would encrypt it using your public key. It's a jumbled mess while it's bouncing around over the internet. And then whenever you receive it at your uh, machine in your browser, your private key can be used to decrypt it. So that is level zero, if you will, of um, public key, private key. He's going to elaborate a little bit more, some tricks that you can do once, once, once you have that established. If I encrypt something with my private key and then publish it, now on the surface of it you'd think, well, what is the point of encrypting it with your private key? Because your public key is out there, so anyone can decrypt it, so why bother encrypting it? But the fact that it can be decrypted with your public key means that it must have been encrypted with your private key, which means it must have been you who made the message because only you have your private key. Cryptographically, you can be certain that it's an authentic message really from that person. So the best thing is when I do both, where I encrypt something with my private key and then your public key, 
and then send it to you. And if we communicate like this, I know that nobody else can read the message. You know that nobody else can read the message. You know that the message has come from me and not an imposter. You also know that the message hasn't been modified because any modification to the message also requires the keys. That's a great secure system and we didn't have to meet up in the park uh, in a shifty way and, and exchange any information or anything. All right, let me talk about what he is talking about here. Let's go back to our image. So this key pair, at the beginning of the video, he talked about you can pick one as your public key and you can pick one as the other as your private key. And that does not matter because as it turns out, this key pair is interchangeable, meaning it can go the other direction. And what he is suggesting is that Alice, if Alice wants to communicate with Bob, Alice could take the message and encrypt it using her private key, which seems a little bit weird except Alice is the only one that has access to Alice's private key. And because these are interchangeable, it could be that message, if it is encrypted with Alice's private key, can be decrypted with Alice's public key. What that means is, if you were to take Alice's public key and try it on a message and it works, it came from Alice. Because the only thing that can decrypt a message that has been encoded with Alice's private key is Alice's public key. So what he is suggesting in the video is that you would basically do both. Let's say that Bob is trying to send to Alice. Well, Bob only wants to communicate with Alice. So Bob would use Alice's public key to encrypt. Bob would also use Bob's private key to encrypt it. The benefit of that is Alice could then in turn use Bob's public key to decrypt it as well as Alice's private key to decrypt the message and not only was it secure, only Alice could read it, Alice knows for a fact that it came from Bob. And this is what we end up doing on the internet, is that basically every, if you want to communicate with Amazon, you've got a public-private key situation going on, and uh, it gets you know dual, dual keys before it's sent out. Um, of note, the certification that you get at, at school Right, whenever you get on our wireless network and they tell you to download a, a certification, you're getting this. You're getting a hold of Cobb County's uh, private key. You'll notice that the only website that you have a problem trying to access without getting the certification are HTTPS websites. Right? If you get on the wireless at school, you don't have a problem accessing HTTP websites because they're not doing secure stuff. What you have a problem accessing without the certification is HTTPS. And that is because what you get from, what you get from um, getting that certification is access to Cobb County's keys. And so any website, say Amazon, Twitch, Google, whatever, that's trying to communicate with you at school via Cobb County needs Cobb County's public key in order to encrypt, and you need Cobb County's private key in order to decrypt. Hey, Neil. So um, a lot of people think by getting that certification that Cobb County is snooping on your machine. That's all it is. All it is is the keys necessary. I'm going to let him finish out this video, and we're going to wrap this up. I think we need never have met. I need to make clear here that I have oversimplified in various ways. People who understand cryptography will be quite upset, probably, right now. But guys, this is, this is why people don't use crypto, because we make it too complicated. Uh, the core concept is simple, and the basic, the, it, this stuff isn't difficult to use, and everyone should. When you put an envelope in the post, you know, you kind of assume, you, you lick the thing and seal it. And if it's been opened, people know it's been opened. And there are laws about this. And we have all of this stuff. And when you communicate in the clear, you know, anyone and his dog can know exactly what you're sending to everyone. And there's no reason to allow that. OK, I do have a question in chat. Is it possible to encrypt audio files? In theory, yes, because you can take the audio and directly translate it into numbers. And that's all that's happening here anyway, is that we're taking numbers, running them through some type of number algorithm that's translating them into different numbers and then sending those out. In theory, yes, you can encrypt anything. Um, I don't quite understand this question. If key is your encryption key, would QWC be your decryption key? 
Uh, it's a lot more complicated than that with public and private key encryption. There is a video here that will be in the slides available on Canvas. Check it out if you're interested in this. It goes super, it gets like really complicated and gets a little bit down into the math of how all this happens. You don't need to know that. All you need to know is the gist of how public private key works. But we're going to wrap it up there, guys. Hope you had a good spring race. Good seeing you back. Let's chill.